over antidepressants, particularly I, I shall be discussing TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants. But before I talk about TCAs and how they work, it's very important that we talk about the pathophysiology of how neurons actually talk to each other inside the brain. On the board here, I've drawn two neurons, and that's typically how neurons talk. And in psychiatry, we always talk about either a presynaptic neuron, and also in neurology, or in a postsynaptic. Pre is before, post is after. So neurons, the first neuron, which is a presynaptic neuron, which I'll be talking about, it's actually called an adrenergic neuron. What does adrenergic neuron mean? It's a neuron that fires neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine. So what I'm actually showing you right here is this is the synaptic cleft. Synaptic cleft. And I, I, I call the synaptic cleft, cleft the junction where neurons come together to meet for dates like match.com, right? So. They're coming together, but in this case, they're going to be exchanging some information, trying to get to know each other. So what's going to happen is this, nor this adrenergic neuron, which carries norepinephrine, we're going to use as NE in this case. And what it actually does is this synaptic vesicles right at the base of the neuron are going to synapse and release norepinephrine to bind into this postsynaptic neuron, which is going to accept the norepinephrine. Postsynaptic neuron. And the information gets triggered, there's depolarization of this membrane of this neuron, and then an action potential is fired, and that goes down the neuron. Now, that is how neurons talk. But there's different kind of neurons in the brain. Everybody has their own label, right? Just like in life, they're cops, they're doctors, everybody has their own job. There's other kind of neurons also that they don't carry norepinephrine. What they carry is serotonin. They carry serotonin. Hmm, serotonin. That's a different kind of neurotransmitter, don't you think? Yeah, so serotonin we also be talking to a postsynaptic neuron which has to accept the serotonin, which is a postsynaptic neuron. Now there are receptors at every single junction. It's like somebody talking to you. You better be listening with your ears, right? So when serotonin is released, it comes down and binds to this postsynaptic neuron, serotonin, SE. But another fancy name for serotonin is 5-HT, 5-HT. On the boards, they like to use these words a lot. They might use serotonin, or they might use 5-HT. 5-HT actually stands for 5, H stands for hydroxy, and T st stands for tryptamine, tryptamine. And you can see this is actually an amino acid, but it's not a biochemical lecture, so we're not going to go over the formation of serotonin. That will be in the subsequent lectures. So this is how serotonin is released. And then serotonin gets released, binds, and magic happens. Now, typically, this neurotransmitter don't stay there for long. They have to be reuptake back into the neuron, right? Because they got to be reused for another time, right? They talk to each other, then they go away. So what actually happens is once serotonin binds, it has to be reuptake back into the presynaptic neuron. Presynaptic neuron. So let's draw that. It has to be reuptake back into the neuron. And somebody is always waiting because the body is very intelligent. So it wants to conserve this. So what it does is there's actually an enzyme, a protein, that sits inside the presynaptic neuron known as the MOA, monoamine oxidase. Monoamine oxidase. And this enzyme is actually going to take up the uh, serotonin and break it down, break it down, all right? So we gotta resynthesize it for later use. The same thing happens to norepinephrine. Once norepinephrine binds, 
to the presynaptic junction, it has to be reuptake back, and the same enzyme known as MOA, monoamine oxidase, is going to break down this norepinephrine. All right, so it gets reuptake. All right, this is the reuptake pathway. They're going down that way. See that? Excellent. Now. We have drugs that specifically target these pathways which we use for depression. So what is depression? Well, depression is a state of mind where patients actually have low levels of serotonin in the synaptic junctions. These patients have low levels of serotonin. So when they don't have enough serotonin, they become very sleepy, they can't concentrate, right? They start, they have loss of energy, they feel they have a lot of sense of guilt, kind of like Siggy Caps mnemonic, exactly. So if you don't have enough serotonin staying in this junction long enough, patients have depression. Well, depression in psychiatry it's a serious disease. On the boards, you can guarantee you there will be a lot of questions about depression because a lot of people have this problem. Well, if someone is depressed, how can we reverse their depression? Well, we go against it and attack it and anti-depress it. Exactly. So that's where the word anti-depression, against depression. We don't want you to be depressed. We want you to be happy and live a very long life be excited. So, let's pick up the first drug which we're going to be talking about in this lecture, which is TCAs. TCAs. I can guarantee you TCAs is extremely high yield. They're going to test you a lot because this drug can be tested in multiple ways and I'll show you how this should be tested on the boards. So, TCAs. TCAs are known as tricyclic antidepressant. Now the boards love this medication for one good reason is because it has a lot of side effects and there's so many ways that you can be tested on these medications. Well what are the drugs that are that you need to memorize and know for the boards? Well let me write at the bottom here. So TCA drugs must know. This is Five star, tattoo it in your brain. This is gonna be tested. All right. So we've got clomipramine, amoxipine, doxipine, or desipramine, imipramine, nortriptyline and amitriptyline. You probably wonder, how, how will you be able to say all this? How did you memorize this? Yeah, I'm going to show you right now how you're going to memorize these drugs for the boards. Now, the way you, the mnemonic I use, remember I told you these guys try to meet each other. Always remember when you're going on a date, you ask a girl out, let's have a dinner. Exactly. In this case, we're going to be out when you see the girl, you tell her, I'll see you at dinner. They're like, yeah, I'll see you tonight at dinner. So what I came up with the mnemonic, C, right? U, we're not going to count the U, at, let's do that, at dinner. Because they're going to be going out on a date. So C for clomipramine, don't worry about the U, uh, ignore that. A for amoxipine, D stands for doxipine or desipramine, I imipramine, and nortriptyline, A amitriptyline. Genius, right? So you never forget these drugs ever again because you're going to see them at dinner. Excellent. But that's not the end. How are we going to use these medications? How do they work? Well, the mechanism of action is the most important thing you have to memorize aside from the name of a drug and its side effects. If you know the mechanism of action of every single drug and their side effects, you're going to rock the boards and I can guarantee you you're going to do really well in this test. So, what is the mechanism? The mechanism is they inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin at the neuronic synapses. 
What do you mean by that? Wait a minute. Let's take a look over here. Oh, I said they're going to inhibit the reuptake. Oops, oops, oops. Right? They're going to break that. They're not going to let that happen. They're going to prevent norepinephrine from being reuptake. See that? Lots of norepinephrine. All of them are waiting in line. They try to be reuptake. They're waiting in line. So it's almost like they're voting. But no, they can't be reuptake because TCA uh, of these drugs is going to inhibit them from being reuptake back into the presynaptic neuron to be broken down mono, by monoamine oxidase. The same thing is going to happen right here to our serotonin. They're going to prevent serotonin from being reabsorbed, so they're going to inhibit that. And this is going to prevent serotonin from being reabsorbed back into the presynaptic neuron. Now you're probably wondering, wait a minute, so we're going to have a lot of serotonin and we're going to have a lot of norepinephrine in the synaptic junction. That is a lot of good news. I'll be very excited. Why? Because now we said depression is loss of what? serotonin. So now if I can give you a drug that can increase the amount of serotonin at the presynaptic junction and give you norepinephrine, right? If, if a snake comes out right now, out of nowhere, everybody's going to run. What's that? That's the adrenergic response in our body using the sympathetic nervous system to activate, to allow us to be able to prevent us from getting armed. So that's norepinephrine. When you have a lot of norepinephrine, you're excited. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Well, that's why we want to take people from a state of depression to a state of e excitement, right? So that's what the drug does. That's why people have a lot of serotonin, a lot of norepinephrine while they're taking tricyclic antidepressants. Now, we use it for depression. So let's talk about clinical uses of this medication. So uses of the drug. One, depression. But because the boards love this medication, they're going to test you on all the things that this drug is used to be treated. So one of the classic story they're going to give you on the board is going to be a five-year-old daughter was brought in by her mom to the office, complaining that she has been peeing in bed, she's been urinating a lot. Well. Which of the following medications can be used as an adjunct to prevent this patients from urinating? They've tried all the preventive me measures. They've tried the bell. They've tried to wake her up in the middle of the night. Still didn't work. What other medicines can you give? Well, the drug of choice, which is a tricyclic antidepressants, but can be used for aneurysis, which means urinating in bed at night, is imipramine. Imipramine, so we use this for aneurysis, right? Aneuresis. I mean, you're urinating in bed at night. So imipramine, you must know that. That is super high yield. That you got to watch out for imipramine because you can use it for aneurysis. Well, another medication out of this list that you need to remember one of the uses of TCAs for the boards is clomipramine. Clomipramine. Well, clomipramine can be used to treat patients that have OCD, right? Obs obs obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Patients that want to clean everything, make sure they have to be perfect, right? And they're so compulsion, they have to do it over and over and again. Well, if they ever ask you a question in psychiatry, and you notice they're asking a question about a patient that have signs and symptoms of obsession and compulsion. They feel like, oh, they think there's germs in their hands and they have to clean it all the time. Well, and they have to clean their hands every two minutes or they have to check the door at night like 10 or 15 times a night because, you know, they just worried that they haven't locked the door yet. Well, you can give the patient clomipramine as a medication to control this behavior. Well, those are the clinical uses and you better remember all this. Super high yield information. Now, because the board loves the side effects of these medicines. They love it so much. They will test you on the side effects of TCAs. And I'm going to break it down for you one after the other. So let's talk about side effects.
See, side effects of this medication, this medication has a lot of side effects because they can, they affect alpha receptors. So let's erase this so we can get some space. The side effect of this medication goes in a lot of ways. So I'm going to tell you what they affect. They have alpha-1 blocking reaction. Alpha-1 blockade. Well, they also can affect muscarinic receptors having anticholinergic side effects. And aside from that, they're toxic when you overdose on this medication. So let's take a look at the first one. And I'm going to start with a case. A 75-year-old male was brought into the office complaining of lightheadedness, especially every time the patient stands up from a sitting position. The patients feel dizzy, lightheaded, right? And patients feel like his heart rate is a little bit Increase, they say the, the patient's resting heart rate is about 110. And that's basically the case. And they tell you the patient might be taking one of the following medications. Well, the, and the patient has a, let's also remember, the patient has a history of depression and is taking one form of antidepressant. Now, on the boards, what they're trying to let you know is this patient is experiencing side effects of the medicines because when, when a patient gets a blockade of the alpha-1 receptors, what happens? They get orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension. What does that mean? Orthostatic means when I get up from a sitting position, my blood pressure drops, right? Because my blood pressure drops, I decrease my preload to the heart, decreasing cardiac output eventually, which means they can decrease the blood pressure, and these patients become lightheaded. That is what they're trying to explain to you. So that's because all their alpha-1 receptors, remember alpha-1 receptors normally uses what? Norepinephrine to bind to it, and norepinephrine can bind and, you know, causes increase in blood pressure, right? But in this case, once you block them, you decrease your blood pressure because they vasodilate both the arterial system and the venous system in the body. So remember that. The next side effect you need to memorize for TCAs for the boards is they have anticholinergic properties. So cholinergic usually what? Acetylcholine, right? Which means they can block acetylcholine receptors. Amazing. The same drugs. Yeah. So we've got receptors for acetylcholine in the body, but the problem is these drugs can come and block them. Well, the side effects you're going to develop when patients have anticholinergic uh, tox uh, uh, effects of these medications is going to look like they actually have sympathetic response. That's how you should remember it, which means if I knock out acetylcholine, which is a parasympathetic neurotransmitter, what's going to be left? Unopposed sympathetic response, and when my sympathetic Nerves are firing. What do you think is going to affect? Hmm, let's see. My heart. When sympathetic is firing a lot of my heart, what happens? It beats really, really fast, so I develop tachycardia. Tachycardia. Remember I told you that patient's resting heart rate was 110. Well, not just my heart is going to be affected. Also, my mouth is going to be affected. They're going to have dry mouth because Normally, your salivary gland is what's responsible for secreting a lot of saliva. And it's under the effect, uh, effect of parasympathetic nervous system. If we block that off, you develop dry mouth. Also, your eyes, you should expect these patients also can develop urinary retention. Urinary retention. The bladder, right? This is our bladder. Coming from the kidneys has a detrusor muscle in it that has muscarinic receptors that actually tells the bladder muscle to squeeze. So when the bladder muscle squeezes, this dilates, the urethra sphincter dilates, and then urine can come out, right? But if I block these receptors, what happens to the bladder? Well, it's not going to be able to contract because there's no parasympathetic to tell it. S1, S2, S2, 3, 4 keeps the bladder off the floor, right? So now we've knocked that out, 
the patient's gonna have urinary retention. So the patient might complain of, oh doc, you know, I go to the bathroom, I try to pee, but it's not coming out. That's because they have effects of the medicine. Oh, I have dry mouth. It's because of the side effect of their medications. In elderly people, they might develop hallucinations. They might be hearing voices. That's one of the side effects of the medicine. And because they're very sensitive to these medications, they can develop confusion. So you gotta be careful giving older people anticholinergics, which is from the side effects coming from TCAs. Now, this is gonna be the last thing we gotta know about TCAs before we move on. So on the boards, they're gonna test you on a patient that's gonna come with an overdose of tricyclic antidepressants, and you better be ready for it. You know they're gonna give you that question, and you don't wanna miss it. And we're gonna get those baby points because we're gonna rock these boards, right? So they're gonna give you a case of a patient for example, they might tell you a 19-year-old female with a past medical history of depression. Right? 19-year-old female has history of depression, presents to the emergency department with convulsions. And the patient is in unresponsive, she's unconscious which means she's in coma. And you notice the patient's heart rate was 180, or let's give you 150. That means the patient is tachycardic. So, you will, because you don't really know what's going on with the patient, they say they ordered an electrocardiogram which shows this. And they show you this electrocardiogram. And they said, which of the following medications is she taking? Well, let's take a look at the case. It's 19 year old has a history of depression, coming with convulsion, has a heart rate of 150. EKG shows, hmm, let me take a look at this EKG. I noticed this EKG has some widened QRS, widened QRS complex. That is the key. When you see widening QRS on the boards, always know very few things cause a lot of widening QRS. Hyperkalemia can cause it, but patients that have overdose on TCAs develop widening QRS complexes on their electrocardiogram. The moment you see that, I want you to connect this EKG to depression and coma. So because they're gonna come in with three C's, that's the mnemonic you need to remember. For the boards, three C's, they are, have coma, they come in with convulsions, and they have cardiotoxicity. Cardiotoxicity, these patients are at a very high risk of dying. So remember, three C's, cardiotoxic, the answer is the patient is taking, and they might put one of those medications, and let's say they put in their amitriptyline as one of the answers, amitriptyline. Tillin, they can put venlafaxine, they can put bupropion, haloperidol, actually let's just put um, let's put all those three for now. Well the answer is going to be amitriptyline because it's the only medication that can make you go into convulsions, coma, tachycardia, and also give you widening QRS complexes. So you pick A as your answer. But because they're going to take it a step further, because when they come in they might say, so now the next question might tell you, what are you going to use to treat this patient and prevent them from dying? The answer is, this high yield answer, are you ready for this, is sodium bicarbonate. And you're going to see that on the exam, sodium bicarbonate. And the way this works is, remember, I told you that these patients are predisposed to having anticholinergic toxicity and cardiotoxicity. So sodium bicarbonate is what you use to reverse, is the antidote for TCA's overdose. Because this is going to help protect the, the heart 
and provide a lot of sodium ions to allow for depolarization of the sinus node to be able to reverse this patient's arrhythmias. Okay, so that's very important, sodium bicarbonate to reverse TCA overdose, all right? Super high yield, super high yield drug, okay? Now, remember these drugs makes adults sleepy, right? It's very sedating, and the least sedating of them is desipramine. And that's all you need to know for TCAs. Now, all this information I just gave you right now came from page 75 of USMLE, Step Up to USMLE Step 1 book, which is table 2, 2 and 1, 2, 21. My job is to oversimplify the information, right? So when you read it, you might read it and it's like, okay, I got this, you know, I was reading that major depression, sedation, but the problem is, now that I've explained it to you, you can further understand it better and see how it's going to be tested. And that's my job, to make the information and present in a format that you will be able to actually apply to the test. You know what's high yield, what you, know, what you need to know for the exam, and so you can study well and score a 99 percentile. That is my goal. That's what I want you to do. So you can rock these boards and get into your residency of choice. Now, thank you very much.